Okay. Back in Acts. Moving on. Paul is winding up here in chapter 20, his third missionary trip, and is headed back to Jerusalem and whatnot with the intent of then going to Rome and to Spain. Okay? Now, we don't know, we know he ends up in Rome <laughs> after a two-year imprisonment, <laughs> right, in uh, Jerusalem, but we don't know if he ever made it to Spain. There are people saying that when he was released from prison in Rome, that that's what he did. After spending some time in Rome, he went to Spain and then came back and, and um uh, and may have ended up, may have actually ended up back near Ephesus and, and did get to see these people again. But when he's leaving, he has no intention of coming back to this area. He's going to move on, you know, because he spent a total of three years in Ephesus, right? So <clears throat> when he's going back, he's trying to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. So he doesn't actually go to Ephesus, but he goes to Miletus and asks for the leaders of the church at Ephesus to come to meet him there, which they do, right? So that's the stage of getting to where we're at as our lesson begins, you know, in verse 22. But there's a couple of things that just, you know, we just kind of blow by when you're going through this like this and you're skipping chapters and whatnot, right? One of them is that Troas, this guy falls off the top of this wall and dies, and Paul just brings him back to life. And just, it's a little, just a little mention, you know, <laughs> that a guy falls off the wall, dies, and Paul brings him back to life. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's kind of a big deal, <laughs> right? But it does say that the, all, all kinds of miracles were happening with Paul during this time, right? So, uh, I just thought it was interesting that something like that gets just a little mentioned, you know. <laughs> so we get to 22, right? But I'd like to start in 21 because it simply says, you know, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> right? Paul's message. It's a simple message. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. Jesus is him, <laughs> right? God came to earth, died on the cross, rose again on the third day, so you can now be forgiven of your sins and live eternally with him. You want to do it? <laughs> right? He's, he's not making it complicated, is he? <laughs> what well, fell off a wall, man. <laughs> yeah, he, he's up there speaking all night, and the guy fell asleep and fell off the wall. <laughs> you know? And then in verse 22, And now behold, bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. One little point to note, the spirit... Bound in spirit, the S is not capital. So Paul, excuse me, Luke, <laughs> is implying that Paul had said he was bound in his spirit. Paul wanted to get to Jerusalem. It didn't necessarily mean the spirit was saying, you need to be there by Pentecost. Because this is a lowercase s, not the uppercase for the Holy Spirit, right? But this is something he really wanted to do. He said, but except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. <laughs> so God keeps telling him what's about to happen. Right? But he says, and boy, the Lord hit me between the eyes with this, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish the course 
and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. He said, I do not consider my life of any account, or my life is not worth one word. You remember the book, The Passion of the, the Purpose Driven Life? I remember the title, I don't remember. 40 Days, The 40 Days. Mm-hmm. Remember day one? No. <laughs> One thing about that book, they, he, he took some liberties in that, you know, but day one was right on. Day one, it's not about you. And you look at Paul here saying, it's not about me, <laughs> right? It's about what Jesus has done. It doesn't matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter if I'm imprisoned, tortured, murdered, you know, doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is Jesus. I, I read that, and I was like, let's see, probably somewhere around 99.99% of the time, that would not apply to me. <laughs> I spend most of my time, you know, thinking about what matters to me. What do I need to do? What do I want to do, you know? rather than what am I supposed to be doing? I couldn't get off that verse for quite a while. He says, in order that I may finish the course. You know, Paul uses the analogy of the race, right? You know, and the ministry or service, which I received. Did Paul volunteer to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ? (laughs) He was kind of snatched, wasn't he? (laughs) On the road to Damascus, the Lord said, Paul? (laughs) Get with it, yeah. I got a program for you, right? So Jesus picked him out and said, I got something for you to do. To testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Right? Again, not complicated. (laughs) You're a sinner. You need a savior. Jesus is him. (laughs) Right? You know, if you look at Galatians 2.20, he says... I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Right? In Philippians 3... He says, although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Remember who he was? As he says, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness which is in the law found blameless. Right? So, And when he says a Hebrew of Hebrews, he's saying, my father and my mother were both pure Hebrews. (laughs) And I'm a pure Hebrew, (laughs) right? A Hebrew of the Hebrews. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. (laughs) Right? In 2 Timothy, if I can get there real quick, chapter 2, verse 4, 
nope, that's not it. What did I write down? <laughs> Second Timothy 4, <laughs> verse 7. <laughs> right? He says, and this is similar to what he was just reading, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Now, when he says, I fought the good fight, does that mean he was always successful, that he never, he didn't sin? No. Not at all, does it? Read Romans 7. <laughs> when he says that I don't do what I want to do, I do what I don't want to do, you know, oh, what a wretched man that I am, <laughs> right? Which kind of gives me hope, because what a wretched man I am. I don't do what I'm supposed to do. I do a lot of things, you know, that I'm not supposed to do. You know, I, that, that little Larry gets in, in the way of, of Jesus too many times. <laughs> All right? You could stop by being so mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just rising. Yeah. <laughs> just trying to have some fun. <laughs> More bacon. Yeah, I could bring more bacon. <laughs> Looks like that's got postponed, Jerry. <laughs> Next week won't be bacon week. <laughs> All right. So anyway, testifying of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, a little bit of change in the subject here. Behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will see my face no more. Because we don't know much about the leaders, how many were there, how many came, how old they were. You know, when he does finally get back, they may have graduated, <laughs> right? They may have gone on to be with the Lord. Who knows, right? But he remember, he, his plan was to go to Jerusalem back to Antioch, and then set sail for Rome, right, and then on to Spain. He says, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Now, what do you think he means by that? I don't know, what are you That's in verse 26. Right? Are you familiar with the uh, the watchman on the wall? In Ezekiel 33, the first nine verses describes the watchman on the wall. Right? And what's the watchman's duty? To see if there's any enemy coming off in a distance, right? And if he sees somebody, he goes and warns everybody. Right? So if the watchman falls asleep... <laughs> And the town gets sacked, as they would say in the old English, right? <laughs> then he's at fault, isn't he? Right. But if the watchman sees him and yells out and tells everybody and they ignore him, he's not at fault. They are. And that's what Paul's saying. I've done my duty. I did what God told me to do. And I've witnessed to all of you, Right? Now it's up to you. I'm not responsible for that. I'm innocent of your blood. If you end up going to hell, it's not my fault. <laughs> right? That's what he's saying there. I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. <laughs> you know. Verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Right? <clears throat> Do we have to be careful not to sin ourselves? Everybody has to be careful not to sin. Yeah, do our best not to sin, right? Well, but in addition to that, these people who have been, right, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. 
So you've got to not only look out for yourself, you've got to look out for the rest of the people, the flock. You notice the shepherd analogy keeps coming up over and over and over, doesn't it? And in the 23rd Psalm, David says, the Lord is my shepherd, right? I shall not want. Right? You get this shepherd analogy, Jesus is called the good shepherd, right? Who sacrifices his life for the sheep. We have that analogy a lot because there was a lot of sheep herding going on in that area. Everybody understood those analogies. Right? So we got that again, and if we look at 1 Peter 5, in verse 2 it says, Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, Yet, <clears throat> nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. <laughs> so if you do right, you'll be rewarded, right? Whatever the unfading crown of glory is, besides spending eternity with Christ, right? Which is pretty sounds like a pretty good deal to me. <laughs> God is love, shall we spend eternity with love or eternity in punishment? <laughs> Gee, I have to think about that. <laughs> right? It seems like it's a no-brainer. So the question is, why is it so hard for people to surrender and accept Christ, you know, rather than have to deal with all of the stuff and to worry about eternity and, you know, in hell? They want to do what they want to do. Bottom line. I don't want to be accountable to God. I want to do what I want to do, right? And the same thing, though, we go back to, you know, we're talking about up here at verse 24, right? Why is it that it's not God's will that's done in my life 100% of the time? It's because I want to do what I want to do <laughs> rather than doing what God wants me to do. Putting self first. Putting self first, right? You know? At least the Holy Spirit was able to get a hold of me enough <laughs> to convince me to trust Jesus. That's why we're here. <laughs> right? He says, so you've got to be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Right? God put you in that role as a servant, to shepherd the church of God, right? As Jesus said, the chief shepherd, right? The good shepherd, I will lay down my life, right? Which he purchased with his own blood. Now, we know God the Father didn't do that. It was God the Son. <laughs> but since it's one God, you can say that God purchased with his own blood. The triune God. He laid down his life so that we could have eternal life. As they say, right, if you... <clears throat> My brain's not working, right? <laughs> if we were to... First off, you're gonna you're gonna be born as a human, but then if you're born again, right? Then you're gonna live eternally, right? But if you're not born again, when you die, what's the phrase that goes with that, Paul? Live. Why is my brain not working? I need more C60. <laughs> well, I tell you, that's, that's weird. Well, you're not the only one that can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Where's Max? He probably think <laughs> he'd think of it. He just wouldn't be able to tell us yeah, what it was. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't get it out. Yeah. Anyway, so God purchased us with His own blood, but He says, "Because remember, we're to watch out for ourselves and the flock." I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So you have the enemy without attacking. Satan never gives up. <laughs> right? Until he is bound and put into hell himself, he's not going to give up trying to mess with everybody he can. Even the flock. Right? Savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. And from amongst your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things. Even some of your own, the enemy within. So as a overseer, <laughs> you've got to look out for both. The external attacks on the church and internal attacks, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. How many times have we heard of these shall we say, preachers who then draw a group of people away from what we would call orthodox Christianity, right? To some other perverted thing. Right? They don't always take them to South America and kill them, but... <laughs> you know? And of course, the enemy without can appear to be the enemy within with different theology whether they're Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses or whatever, and call themselves Christians, right? Or even a large part of the Roman Catholic Church who deny that it's faith by Jesus alone. No, you've got to have the church. No, you have to have Mary. <laughs> they start adding all this stuff. So the people that are charged by the Holy Spirit to be the overseers have to look out for both types of enemies, not just the ones that are obvious like the enemy without, but even the ones that sneak up on us, the enemy within. And to add a little politics to that, when you swear to uphold the Constitution against all enemies, both foreign and domestic, right? It's somehow we tend to, tend to ignore the domestic enemy, you know? And we got quite a few of them. So we have the enemy within in that area also. But our focus here, of course, is on the simple truth that all have sinned come short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior, right? And the wages of sin is death. death. Death meaning spiritual death, right? And that's the saying, right? If you're born twice, you only die once. <laughs> if you're only born once, you die twice. Because <laughs> you have your physical death and spiritual death and end up in hell for all eternity. For all eternity. That's the one that I can't imagine. Yeah. We don't understand that at all because we don't, we don't know, because time is hard enough just to understand. But time is something God created, right? He exists outside of time and space. And we will too at some point. Now, during our thousand-year reign here, when we're reigning on earth in our glorified bodies, I guess there's still time, because we're here for a thousand years, <laughs> right? That's a time element. After that, you know, we're just with Jesus no matter what. <laughs> if there is time or no time or all time or what, you know, who knows? Doesn't matter. He might create a whole new type of time. <laughs> Do the people who are go to heaven ever fall away? No. 
there are people who will be on earth at the end of the thousand year reign when for some reason God decides to let the devil loose for a little while and he tricks people and pulls them away from following God. So Satan gets to wrap up a few more to take with him to hell at the end of the thousand year reign. And then he throws the Satan, Satan into the, the dungeon forever at that point. So people will still be able to fall away even at that point. But not those that have been forgiven, you know. That once Jesus has a hold of your hand, done deal. <laughs> you can't get away. Well, at what point does Jesus have a firm hold on you? The second you accept him as Lord and Savior into your life. Well, that point from then on, you are saved forever, no matter what. Okay. I, uh, there were other discussion somehow in there, and I got to... So don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Got yeah. In verse 31, it says, Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. All right? As I've been here three years teaching you night and day, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So you'll be all be with us together in heaven when, when this thing is all finished up, right? Because, you know, remember, he's leaving. And he says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes, which wealthy people in those days, what did you want? You know, gold, silver, clothes, maybe a house, you know, right? You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me, right? Now, he's not saying that, because we know that he's taught that the worker is worth his wages, and even Jesus tells us that, right? But in this case, he thought it best for him to make his own way, along with teaching and preaching, and you remember what Paul did to make a living? He was a tent maker. So he'd make tents, make a living, cover his own expenses, right? You know, but he also was picking up, uh, uh, good grief, <laughs> something to take back to the church of Jerusalem that was suffering, right? You know, but he covered his own deal. He says in verse 35, And everything I showed you, that by working hard in this matter, you must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Now I dare you to find where Jesus said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. We don't know where he said that. It's not in the Gospels. <laughs> right? It's one of the most public scriptures in the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, and in, and in my Bible, it's in red print. You know, Jesus said it. You know, Paul's saying that Jesus said it. Right? Now, when he said it, I have no idea. But apparently he said it. <laughs> of course, you know, like in John, he says, if we were to write everything that Jesus did, the whole world couldn't hold right. all the books. <laughs> right. right? So he did a lot of stuff that's not recorded and said things that were not recorded in God's word. Here we have it recorded after the fact. Paul's telling us that Jesus said it. Maybe Jesus said it to him on the road to Damascus. <laughs> well, I was getting ready to say, considering how they met, if you believe that, why wouldn't you believe this? <laughs> yeah. You know. So Paul, in his departure from the church of Ephesus, after spent the total time of three years, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> there 
teaching, as he says, day and night. So besides the time he spent making tents, he spent the rest of the time teaching and preaching to both the Jews and the Greeks, right? Because he would always go to the synagogue first, right? And then end up somewhere else because some of the Jews would believe and some wouldn't, right? But in three years, he built quite a church at Ephesus. The Holy Spirit actually did, but used Paul to do it, right? And now he's departing, and he's heading out, going back to Rome. <laughs> what was that? Sounds like a bullet impact on a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Brain breaking, yeah. Kind of got the hairs on the Yeah, it's 10, 10, oh, it's 10 36. Well, any questions or comments about Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 22? Well, the biggest problem is how do you follow all of that and do all of that? Like I say, I, most of the time, I have to admit, I. I have a tendency to put Larry first rather than Jesus. All right. Well, Heavenly Father, 